Good evening, everyone. I'm David Hampson, president of the Aero Club in New England, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we have a great presentation by our guest, Jim. Before I um, introduce Jim, I just wanted to mention a couple things about, about the Aero Club and some of our upcoming events. Um, our, our next event is actually this, this Saturday, the 26th, and it's actually an in-person event. Uh, we're having a gathering, a um, outing at uh, uh, at uh, so, um, so Aviation, um, Min, Min Airfield. Uh, we'll be gathering at Nancy's Cafe this Saturday for, for lunch. So um, if you'd like to if you'd like to join us, I believe there's still an opportunity to uh, to, to to join the group. And details of the event can, are, can be found on our website under the event section. Then we have another event happening on July 10th which is another outing. This will be at uh, uh, Katama Airfield at Martha's Vineyard, also for a uh, lunch gathering. And we're also in the, in the middle of planning a members appreciation cookout event at, at also at Minuteman Airfield in Stowe that will occur in late August. And details and a save the date information will be forthcoming on that as well. So we're very excited to, after many months of having almost exclusively virtual events to be able to resume some in-person gatherings as well. Um, but, you know, if the year continues on, we'll, we'll revert to in-person gatherings, but still keep a virtual component and be able to put people with, with content uh, virtually as well who aren't able to attend in person. We have seminars like this. Um, but uh, with further ado, I'm going to provide some introduction to, to our guest speaker tonight, Jim Baum, who's somebody who I've known for a number of years, and he's He's an outstanding pilot and an all around great person. So I appreciate his, his kind uh, kindness in, in sharing his experiences tonight. Uh, Jim, Jim flies a TBM 940 currently and also a Cub Crafters X Cub. Jim fell in love with flying as a high school student in upstate New York after taking a flight with his high school librarian. He earned his private pilot certificate in 1988 and, and holds a commercial certificate, instrument rating, single engine seaplane rating, Tearwell endorsement, and he has over 4,200 hours in his logbook to date. Jim's professional background includes 20, over 25 years of experience in growing and managing cutting edge tech companies in the Boston area. Uh, he's a trust, trustee at Worcester Polytech Institute, a board member at several, several tech businesses, as well as a lecturer in entrepreneurship at MIT Sloan School. His wife, Deb, and the two children frequently fly with him on various adventures around the world. And, when I say adventures, Jim has some real amazing adventures he's going to share with us tonight, um, and he has some great pictures and, and, and stories as well. So, um, so Jim, I'll turn it over to you now, and, uh, and thank you again for this presentation. Thanks, David, and thanks for the kind words, and, uh, and, and thanks to you and Keith for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, this is really fun for me. We did this trip in 2018, and uh, I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, you know, since shortly after the trip. So uh, it's been a fun journey down memory lane for me today, kind of pulling some of these, uh, some of these images and, and stories together uh, from the trip. Um, and so uh, what I'd like to, to do tonight is try to step you through a little bit of our experience uh, on flying a single engine turboprop aircraft around the world. Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite an adventure and it was, uh, a lot of interesting things uh, related to flying and a lot of interesting things related to the experiences we had in various places, uh, countries and cities that, uh, that we went. So I'll share a little bit of all of that with you. The, the, um, you know, the highlight of the trip, the, the headline is, this is what we did. We, we flew this TBM that you see, that's my wife, uh, Deb and I, uh, we flew this TBM 930 uh, around the world in about 69 days. Uh, it was 22,188 nautical miles, 5,365 gallons of jet fuel. Please don't do the math on the carbon footprint there because it's, uh, it's astonishing. Uh, only 34 takeoffs and landings and actually only 88.3 hours in the logbook, which surprised me when I ended it up. But we saw 25 different countries, uh, multiple stops in some countries. Um, we would often stop and spend you know, um, two or three nights in one place. And so we got to sort of really experience uh, a number of different places as we traveled around the world and, and really just um, memories of a lifetime, uh, amazingly fun. And uh, I'll, hopefully I can share some of that with you tonight and you can get a little sense for what we did. 
Um, I don't know if any of you have thought about doing something like this, um, but you know, the prospect of flying a single engine airplane around the world, um, at least for me, I found it a little overwhelming. You know, my international flight experience prior to this trip was flying to Canada, like so many of us. Um, and I had uh, never flown in Europe or other parts of the world. And so we were way out of our comfort zone. And there were so many different things to think about with permits and overflight permits and landing permits and where do you buy fuel and how do you not get ripped off and what about the visas and what's required. And it was uh, an awful lot to think about. And I think that, you know, for us and for me to, to think this through, it was not something that I really felt comfortable doing on my own. And so we worked with a group that many of you have probably heard of called Air Journey. Um, Air Journey is a company uh, based in South Florida, and this is their business. They put these types of trips together for people who want to use their airplanes in this way. You know, they want to do some, some big adventure or some small adventure. We actually went to Cuba with them as well. That was the first trip we did. Um, but they really take care of all of these logistical concerns. Um, they did all the flight planning, all the fuel um, availability, all the permits, all the visas, all the hotels, dinners, activities, wine, packing recommendations, um, and, and probably very importantly, a, a bullet point I have lower on the slide, which is the, the compatibility of the group. They actually do put a great deal of thought into, you know, who do they put together for these trips? Um, because we ended up doing this with five TBMs total, uh, with a bunch of people who we did not know. We had met uh, one of the people on our trip uh, before we left. Um, and we ended up with a group that we just had a tremendous amount of fun with, formed some, some great friendships, and uh, really found ourselves able to travel very well together. And you, know, you can imagine, you spend over two months together you know, every day, um, you know, multiple meals per day, um, multiple flights during the week. Um, you know, it's really important that the group be able to get along and it, and it, and it worked out well. Um, and, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, the team at Air Journey, they travel with you. Uh, they traveled with us and, uh, and they were just wonderful. So they, they made it fun. They made it easy. I'll tell you a story later on about one of the challenges that we had and what they did. I will say the founder of Air Journey, Terry Pui, this is the best piece of advice he gave us. Uh, you know, take half of what you think you need and bring twice as much money. And it was absolutely true. You know, we got home and we found things in our suitcases that we had never used during the trip. Um, but, you know, credit cards are smoking. So, uh, but it was uh, well worth it, well worth it. Um, so I'll just, I'll start off just with a, give you a little bit of a taste of, of kind of where we, uh, one, of our, one of our first stops outside of the U.S. Uh, we actually started the trip uh, in Quebec City. So we flew from Quebec City or from, um, from uh, the US into Quebec City and we met the group there and then we departed and we went off um, from Quebec City, uh, our, went to Goose Bay, went into Kangaroo Greenland, went across over to Reykjavik, uh, Iceland and then over into Europe via Shannon, Ireland. And so I was able to mount some, some cameras on my TBM uh, under the wing and when I get a little bit of video. So I'll just share this one with you. So this is obviously, uh, the speed has increased greatly just for, uh, for time, but to give you a little bit of a sense of the landscape that we were flying over, this is departing out of Kangaroo Greenland. Um, and you can see just how barren and desolate this is. Um, there are landing options in Greenland along the coast around the lower, the Southern perimeter of it. Um, but it all looks a lot like this. And you can see the airport here off to the right and the climb out on the departure was up over this mountain ridge. Um, and so that was one of, the, one of the early sites that we had, one of the early experiences that we had that was uh, really quite, uh, quite astonishing and breathtaking, just the vastness of it and, uh, and what, we, uh, what we saw. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time tonight and probably focus more tonight since we're all pilots here on um, some of the, the flying considerations that, uh, that we had to sort of address during our flight. And, you know, the, the first leg of the first legs, uh, several legs of this flight were really all about getting across the Atlantic, right? So as I mentioned, from Quebec City, Canada to Goose Bay, 
um, <clears throat> over to Kangaroo-Luswag, over to Reykjavik, down into Shannon, Ireland. Um, there were a number of things that we were doing that, um, you know, certainly we were not used to doing. Uh, I was not used to doing as a pilot. And I suspect many of you are, are not either, unless you've done a lot of flying outside of the US, one of which is position reporting. Um, and, you know, there's a very specific format, you know, we would call um, up for, for our position report and say, you know, Gander Radio, November 9 or 30, Victor Tango, position report. And you'd wait and they'd come back and November 9 or 30, Victor Tango, Gander Radio, go ahead, your position report. November 9 or 30, Victor Tango was uh, at 62 North 55 West at 1215 Zulu, flight level 310, estimate Sierra Foxtrot at 1320, um, Tango Luswag next. Right, and that's the format of the position report, and they were pretty particular about it. Right, so that was one of the things that we had to kind of learn that and get that format down and be comfortable with um, the lat long position reports, and, and also <clears throat> the uh, the TBM nine thirty has a G three thousand in it, and so um, putting the lat long waypoints into the nav, you know, it's not something you do every day, not hard to do, but we certainly had to be comfortable with that because we had to use several of them. Um, the other thing that uh, is was important and was important from this point throughout the entire journey <clears throat> was to use the full end number. So we were in November 9 or 30 Victor Tango. In the U.S. with air traffic control, you'd often say TBM 9 or 30 Victor Tango. And then that would turn into 30 Victor Tango or 0 Victor Tango. None of that applied here. Everything was November 9 or 30 Victor Tango. You never mentioned the type. Um, it's in the flight plan. They don't need it. And it turned out to be something that, you know, also was quite important, especially as radio communications got harder and harder uh, during the course of the trip. Um, HF radio or VHF only? Well, we were VHF only in our TBM. That created certain constraints on us as we were going across the Atlantic, um, you know, and later on actually going into Russia as well. Um, we did not have an HF radio in the airplane. And HF radio is about $100,000 to add to the TBM didn't want to do it for one trip. And so we did it VHF as did all of the TBMs that were together on the trip. 8.33 kilohertz channel spacing, you know, something you don't think about, but we had to use that. And of course we had to carry the survival equipment with us uh, on the flight. And so <clears throat> this is kind of the route that we use, this not kind of, this is the route, the exact route that we used across the Atlantic. It's a screenshot from four flight, but you can see here that, you know, the, uh, the, the waypoints, uh, in Lat Lawn, you know, North 60, West 57, North 64, West 55. Those were our reporting points as we were flying across uh, the Atlantic. And once we were, you know, up around Prawn, the, the Prawn fix that you see here, we were out of radar coverage, right? And so all, all we were able to provide was the position report. Um, I would also point out over on the right side of the screen, you see a fix called Ratsu. And you notice it's a little bit pushed north of a straight line over to the uh, uh, to, to the mainland there in the UK uh, in our, for our trip down into Ireland. Um, and, and the reason for that is there's, if we were to have gone any further south uh, of Ratsu, um, we would have had to have had HF radio. So this was an example of where that constraint didn't add much to our route, but it added a little bit of distance. Uh, and so Ratsu is a fairly famous fix for people who fly across the Atlantic, VHF only, because you've got to use it, because otherwise you're in HF land. Um, I'll just give you a, some, of the, some of the highlights here. I've got a lot of imagery in these slides to share with you, but you know, the, all the survival gear in the plane, we had a North Atlantic certified raft, uh, we had the survival suits, uh, we had the porta potty, which would, turned out to just be weight. We never used it the entire trip, but we had it with us just in case. Uh, and then all of our other gear. Um, I, I will admit we didn't wear the survival suits, but but we had them with us, and we were at 31,000 feet, so we knew we had some time to get them on if we needed them. Um, <clears throat> we also had a, a passenger with us uh, on the crossing. Her name was Danielle, <clears throat> and Danielle is a professional pilot who was actually meeting one of the other participants in our group in Europe, and she was going to fly as co-pilot with that person because he was uncomfortable flying the whole trip single pilot. And so uh, we gave Danielle a ride over and uh, she then joined up with, uh, with, with Tile was the fellow's name and, uh, and flew with him. But you can see the TVM just packed to the gills, you know, all the way through here. And uh, it was one of the great things about the airplane is it, uh, it carried the weight well. 
just a view approaching Greenland, uh, just stunning, beautiful views that we saw, barren, desolate places that uh, you just don't see every day. When we got to Reykjavik, I, I, many of you I'm sure have heard about the food scene there, and uh, it is everything it's cracked up to be. Uh, it was really just, just wonderful. We enjoyed some phenomenal meals there, enjoyed the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. Uh, we had a, a little bit of fun together. We had a lot of fun together as a group. And I, you know, this, this picture is kind of a funny picture. We were walking through a store and the guy in the front here down low with the Viking helmet on smiling. Um, this is, this is G, this is Guillaume Fabry who comes from, uh, who, who works with Air, Air Journeys. And he was our, our journey director. And uh, he did all the planning for this. And he did just a phenomenal job, not only planning everything, but really bringing the group together. And I, this, is a, this is early in the trip, and this is where the group was really starting to kind of bond and come together. And we just had a lot of, a lot of fun together throughout. Um, but as you can see on the G3000, there's a lot of water out there that we crossed over, uh, single engine turboprop. Um, the nice thing about the turboprops over water is that as soon as you cross <coughs> the coastline under the water, uh, you fortunately, the engine does not sputter like it always does with a piston, as, as you know. So that was uh, uh, kind of an interesting sight to see. Um, <clears throat> one of the, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah, while, we're, uh, while we have a quick break, we have a question that came in. Oh, sure. Go for it. Do you, do you ever need to have other aircraft do comms relay for you due to VHF only radios or radio coverage difficulties? Yeah. Awesome question. So um, we did not on this flight. However, we did an awful lot of communication aircraft to aircraft. So the way it worked, we had five airplanes and, and G was in the front airplane uh, with another one of the participants in the trip. And so he flew co-pilot with that, with that fellow and his wife. And um, a lot of times we would get into situations where air traffic control was um, incomprehensible. Like you just have no idea what they're saying. I mean, we all know English is the, the language of air traffic control worldwide, but you know English is often a second or third language for the controllers. And so the, they're very, very difficult to understand in certain places. And I'll give you an example of it in a little bit. So what would happen is G would be in the front, he would get some set of instructions and then he would relay it back. And I was usually the second airplane. My wife and I were usually in, in position number two. And then we would relay it back and relay it back. So we had an air to air frequency going constantly between the airplanes. And it was, you know, fun banter going back and forth, of course, but also a lot of clarification of just what the heck is air traffic control saying? Um, and it was really useful. It helped a ton. How far on trail were each aircraft? Um, we, we would depart 15 minutes apart. And, it, and that turned out to be really important, actually, because when we um, when we got a little more stuffed up, um, bad things happened. And, and so, for example, you know, what we found was in, in, early in the trip, you know, G would be like, we're going to depart 15 minutes apart. Everybody do it. It'll work out fine. Everybody's excited. You know, we're all in our airplanes and, and boom, 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 boom. We're off, you know, three to five minutes apart. <clears throat> and then you get to the other end and air traffic control has no idea what to do with you right? Because they don't see small aircraft like this on an everyday basis like we do here in the U.S. And so we have small airplanes flying in at different speeds than the airliners that they're used to. And, you know, people are getting put in holes and people are getting given vectors. And, you know, it just got, they just didn't know how to deal with it. And so we would always, we learned that lesson the hard way after a bunch of us got stuck in a hole because we were anxious to get out. Um, and then they, they would, it would you know eventually clear us and so we learned 15 minutes is required and so that gave us um it was difficult often for the air to air to work from the lead plane to the trailing plane but it was never any problem from aircraft to aircraft so we had good comms the whole time you know one of the things that you worry about a lot when you cross the atlantic is the weather and we we didn't really have much uh, we did pretty well but um Reykjavik I've been there twice now with the TBM and the wind's always just ripping. I just, I just enjoyed this little, I'm going to show a little video here. I'll, I'll play it and tell you about it. Look at the airspeed indicator. Yep. 25 knots indicated airspeed on the ground. Engine not running, sitting still. So that was, um, that was the light wind in Reykjavik. 
<laughs> and it was just constant and gusty and turbulent. And that's just the weather in Iceland. Um, and so it was, uh, we, had a, we had some fun with that. Um, so we got to Europe. Um, as I mentioned, we came in uh, from Reykjavik into uh, Shannon, Ireland. And, um, you know, Europe was a, was a new flying experience. Um, again, more new stuff to learn. Um, one of them is the issue of the, of the transition altitudes. The transition altitudes in Europe, number one, they vary by country. And number two, they're much lower than what we're used to here in the United States. You know, here I can jump in my TBM and I can climb up to 17.5 and fly VFR, no problem, right? Um, in Europe, the transition altitudes are at 3,000, 4,000, or 5,000 feet. So they're very low, uh, you know, and obviously in a TBM, you don't want to be that low because you could be burning 80 gallons an hour doing that. So it really limits, you know, VFR flight possibilities. Um, so we, we were IFR all the time, as you would expect anyway. The other thing is it's expensive. Um, we went into Le Bourget in Paris. That was the airport that we used, um, which is a, it's an awesome airport. Um, but we paid almost 2000 euros for our landing and handling fees and three night, three overnights uh, for the TBM on the ramp, by the way, that was not in a hangar. Um, and so that was, you know, the expense and, and the, the, surprisingly, the fuel expense wasn't that bad. Um, but the, the handling fees, landing fees, and ramp fees were, were quite excessive um, in most of the places we went to in Europe. So we, I mean, we really have it, and I'm, I'm guilty of this myself. I complain about these handling and ramp fees that we see here in the US. Uh, They're nothing compared to what people are paying in Europe. So we really do have it pretty good. The other thing was, you know, everything was um, done via procedure. For every leg of our, fly, of our flying, you could expect to have a departure procedure, an arrival procedure, and an approach for every flight. And then at Le Bourget, they throw you a real curveball and they introduce this thing called an initial approach. You know, the initial approach is uh, a set of waypoints between the arrival and the approach. And nowhere on any chart does it tell you that it exists, uh, but yet you're expected to fly it. And it's not like it's a straight line <laughs> from the end of the arrival to the beginning of the approach. So um, fortunately, you know, we had our expert G with us who uh, briefed us on this beforehand. Um, one of the other things I, 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 you're all aware, I'm sure that, you know, um, in Europe, they're using hectopascals instead of inches of mercury for the altimeter setting. And so you have to change <clears throat> in your avionics um, over to hectopascal units. You have to switch the units over. And the language that they use is this language of being, quote unquote, on the QNH. And on the QNH, they would say a phrase like, which, which is hectopascal, it's an altimeter in hectopascals. And on the QNH, they would say something like, descend 4,000 on the QNH. And I wondered about like, why do they do this? They're very deliberate about it everywhere. And it turns out that it's because A, the transition levels vary by country. So 4,000 in one country could be, um, you know, a non-flight level altitude and 4,000 in another country would be in the flight levels. So they want to make it clear that you're in the flight levels. So your, you know, your altimeter is set to standard. Um, and also for clarity. And apparently there was an American Airlines pilot um, who flew into uh, Le Bourget and he was told uh, to set the altimeter to 982 hectopascals, but the, 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 the units were not stated. And so he set his altimeter to, to 2982. Um, and if you do the conversion, you realize that he was almost a thousand feet off in his altitude with that mistake. And it created a near miss. So that sort of created a culture here of, you know, being very precise. And then Prist, um, we, we didn't need Prist until we got further south in Europe, but the TBM requires Prist here in the US. It's, it's either mixed in during delivery or it's pre-mixed in the fuel. Uh, and uh, in the rest of the world, that's not the case. So we carried, carried two cases of Prist with me in the front of the airplane. Uh, so again, all things that, you know, you don't really think about, but uh, stuff that, that, we, that we dealt with. So I'll give you a little flavor, <coughs> excuse me, of, um, of, of what the route looked like and some of the experiences we had. You know, we went uh, in Europe, we went to Ireland, France, Sicily, Malta, and Greece. And uh, this is basically the route that we flew. 
Um, and just some of the highlights, <clears throat> the Adair Manor in Shannon, Ireland was just an amazing place. Uh, it was a newly renovated castle uh, on an incredible property. Um, you know, they were doing things like falconry there, which we had an opportunity to experience. That's Howard Jansen, who was on the left, who was with us in our group. Um, and just a really cool, unique experience. As you might expect, we found a bar uh, and we, we definitely found some Irish whiskey and a few other interesting things there. We had a good time. Um, we went to the Cliffs of Moher. Uh, that's my wife, Deb. Uh, she's okay. Don't worry about her. She's fine. Uh, we had a good time there. We had a wonderful dinner at the Jules Verne in the Eiffel Tower uh, in Paris. Um, we went down to Malta and uh, again, in, in true G fashion, he grabbed all of these aprons off of one of the street vendors and put them on us and we got this funny picture. Uh, and the group was really coming together at this point, having a lot of fun together. Uh, we stopped in Dijon, uh, France to go to the European TBMOPA meeting and met a bunch of cool people there. Some amazing sights while flying, you know, flying over the Alps, you know, hiking Mount Etna in Sicily. Uh, just a, again, a once in a lifetime experience for us. And then fueling in Malta. And this is where we had to start thinking about Prist. And, and really what we did is the fuelers are fueling the airplane. And, you know, I'm standing next to the airplane with a can of Prist spraying in the appropriate amount as they're fueling it because they won't touch the stuff. Um, the Cedral, Cathedral St. John in Malta and, uh, and finally, we, we made it to Greece. And that was, our, uh, that was our landing beer on our way to the most amazing hotel I think I've ever stayed in, a place called the Amon Zoe. And so one of the, one of the things that Air Journeys does a great job of is, uh, is setting up the accommodations. And so um, we used a number of these hotels from Amon. And this one is the Amon Zoe. Uh, it's outside of Athens. And it is just a, the most uh, tranquil, peaceful, beautiful spot um, you could imagine. And we spent three nights there. So this was kind of the first place we kind of stopped and really spent some time and just relaxed and kind of unwound. So I'll pause there for a minute, see Keith, are there other questions I can address? We do have another one. Um, what was the longest leg for distance and time and any concerns about fuel burn? Yeah, believe it or not, um, the longest leg was from Seattle to Green Bay <laughs> on the way home. We got back to Seattle. It was about four hours and 15 minutes uh, in the TBM. And uh, the, on average, the legs that we flew were about three hours. Um, so they were, not, they were not terribly long and they were not you know, challenging the range of the TBM at all. Um, and so we didn't, we didn't have any problems with with fuel or concern about being low on fuel or really any of any of those kinds of concerns. You know, I think the leg from, for example, like Reykjavik to Shannon was just under a thousand nautical miles, about 940, 950 nautical miles. So um, that's that's th those were pretty common common legs for us. Um, one of the things that Air Journey did is to produce a briefing document which we would review the night before any flight. And these briefing documents were phenomenal. And in fact, I've adopted many of the things that were done in these briefing documents for my own flying um, because they just were so clear. And um, it, it really gave us a very good sense of what to expect the next day. Now, now one of the things that would happen you know, those of you who fly IFR, uh, especially around the Northeast or up and down the Northeast corridor, you know that you file IFR, you, you, you file a flight plan, you choose a route, you choose an altitude, you file, you call, you know, the tower at Hanscom or, or whatever, clearance delivery, and you get your clearance. And, you know, maybe 50% of the time, usually less than that, you get, you know, what you filed. In our experience flying around the world, we got what we filed every single time, right? And so we would, we would file these flight plans the night before and then we would brief them and we would study everything. We would study the airports, we would study the departure procedures, we would study the en route uh, communications challenges that may, we may experience. We'd look at the destination airports. We knew what the runways were like. We had studied the weather. Um, you know, there were, there were a lot of nuances that uh, you know, G would step us through because he had done these flights, um, including things like the altimeter setting and switching it to hectopascals and 
um, terrain that you might experience, or sometimes the controllers would respond in a certain way, um, you know, in a, in a, at a particular airport and he would prep us on that. And so the, 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 the briefings were just awesome and they, they really made the flying easy. Uh, you know, we literally just kind of had to show up and fly the airplane. Um, so anyway, after, after Europe, we made our way into the Middle East and th this is the actual route. And so these, these lines that I'm showing on a couple of different maps here that have the little uh, boxes with them that look like chat windows. These are, this is the tracking that I did on a, uh, on a Garmin inReach device. So this is the actual route that we flew, the actual track that we flew that was tracked by that device. Um, so the Middle East took us into, you know, Aqaba, Jordan. Um, it took us then, you know, into Dubai. Uh, we went through Oman, just really as a tech stop, just for fuel, into Agra, India, and then on to Calcutta, India. And then from Calcutta, we went into Southeast Asia, into Chiang Mai, Thailand. Um, I'll play another little video for you. Um, this is departing Athens, uh, heading into, uh, heading toward Aqaba, Jordan. November 9, 30, fixed of time, go 0, 3, 0 degrees, 1, 2 knots, clear, take off 0, 3, right. Mr. Lugar, may we proceed uh, beyond the phone? Approved for 0, 3, right, all length inspection car now, thank you. Good morning. Absolutely. <coughs> And so uh, just a little sense of kind of what that looked like. And here's the departure procedure that we flew out of the Athens, uh, you know, international airport. Um, and you can, you can hear this controller was very good. Uh, I have another video later I'll play for you where the controller is not quite as good. Um, but, you know, this flight was very interesting because as we briefed this flight, we came across this NOTAM. And uh, I will just leave it on the screen here for a second. You don't have to read it, but... Um, what, what, you will, what you will see if you do read it is that it's a NOTAM that is uh, advising uh, aircraft flying over the Sinai Peninsula um, to remain above flight level 260 um, because of the risk from potential extremist militant attacks involving anti-aircraft weapons, including manned portable air defense systems, anti-tank missiles, small arms fire, and indirect fire from mortars and rockets targeting aircraft and Sinai airports. Terrifying, right? We read this NOTAM the night before. And, uh, and as you know, it's a very unstable part of, uh, part of the world. Um, and this NOTAM was issued by, uh, I believe it was issued by five different countries um, for flying through this area. So, um, you know, TBM, the uh, service ceiling on that aircraft is flight level 310. So uh, we stayed above uh, flight level 260 the whole way. And then just, you, you just end up dropping in pretty quickly uh, down into, into Aqaba. Now, uh, air, the Aqaba airport is positioned you know, right next to uh, Israel, right? So you're very close to Israeli airspace. And so this was actually an approach. Uh, one of the things that some of us did to prepare for this trip is we went to SimCom in Florida, which is the simulator uh, training uh, group that trains on the TBM. Uh, and we flew a bunch of these approaches in the simulator, just to be familiar with it. On this particular approach, uh, if you happen to be off course to the left, um, I believe about three miles, uh, you end up in Israeli airspace without a permit. Okay, here we are. Just about to level up 6,500. Look at that terrain. Aqua approach November 930, Victor Tango is uh, in the turn and lost till now. November 930, Victor Tango, Roger, uh, continue to send uh, the group 5. And uh, this now, King of Santo, 118, decimal 1, how are you doing? You can hear the controller. Getting a little harder to understand. Power approach 3 1 is ready for taxi. And there we go, landing runway 01 uh, in Aqaba. So that, this, was a, this was a really cool flight. Um, you know, A, we ended up in, in the Middle East and you can see the, the terrain and the desert, the mountains, you know, and B, the political situation was really interesting. Uh, and, and just reading that note to him the night before was, uh, was, was kind of a, 
interesting, memorable experience. A um, couple highlights in photos here. You know, this is flying over the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, we landed at Aqaba at the King Hussein Airport, you know, fueling up the airplanes. This is one of the TBMs that was with us. This is a TBM 9, 910. Uh, this is the airplane actually that G flew in um, with Don and Kathy, who were, uh, who were the owners of that airplane. Uh, here we are in downtown Aqaba uh, that night. Um, one of the other participants with us, uh, this is Lizzie uh, from the UK. Uh, she got her hijab. So we did, we did lots of shopping, as you might imagine, uh, and had lots of fun experiences like, you know, riding into the Sikh. We, one of the highlights, of course, in, in Jordan uh, is to go visit the city of Petra, which, you know, we did and saw lots of uh, really interesting sites, a, a number of I have a number of photos like this of uh, street performers that were there uh, performing as you go into Petra. Here's the, the famous treasury uh, in Petra carved into the sandstone um, that we had an opportunity to just, you know, stand right under and next to and take photos of. Um, you know, another sort of interesting perspective on this flight, you know, if you look at the, the moving map here on the G3000, uh, you can see you know, Syria, Iraq, Iran, all there within range, within easy range. This was after we left um, and headed in toward, uh, toward Oman. Uh, but uh, it was uh, kind of a, something I didn't really think would be as impressive to me as it was, but I found that to be a, a memorable uh, part of the flight. Um, and then this is landing in Dubai. And uh, I just want to talk about the Dubai airport for a second. This, this was um, perhaps the most amazing airport I've ever seen in my life. Um, for those of you who have landed your airplanes at large airports like Washington Dulles, uh, you know that they can, you know, the hardest part of that can be figuring out how to taxi. You know, you, you land on this huge runway, you get off on taxiway Bravo, and they tell you to taxi to wherever, and they give you 16 instructions of taxiways and three different controllers to talk to, and it's just mind boggling. Well, at the Dubai airport, uh, they do it a little better than that. You land, you get off at your taxiway, you stop, you switch over to the ground controller, and then the ground controller will basically say, um, he, he said so, I don't remember the exact phrase, but it was something like follow the lights. And I didn't know what that meant, follow the lights. What does that mean? And I looked out the windshield and I saw ahead of me, and I wish I had photos of it, I don't, I saw ahead of me a row of green lights in the center of the taxiway. And as I taxied forward and followed the lights, they would go off behind me and new lights would light up. And so it literally just snaked me through and I, it, was a, it was about a mile and a half taxi at this airport to get to where they put us, because uh, we were obviously not in the main terminal area. And we taxied along and it just would progressively take us following the green lights. It was just one of the coolest things I ever saw. And it was just the beginning of, you know, the experience in Dubai, which just reeks of money. They picked us up from Jet Aviation, the FBO, and in the Rolls Royces, and, you know, that's, uh, and took us to the hotel. And we stayed in the Burj Al Arab, you know, which is, uh, you know, one of the world's only six star hotels, uh, which was quite a fascinating experience. And we just had, we had a lot of fun in Dubai, a lot of interesting experiences there. Uh, we went sand dune smashing and we went indoor skiing there and uh, actually had a really fun time. Uh, from Dubai, we went to Oman, uh, which was just a tech stop, as I mentioned, which then took us into Agra, India. And so Agra was um, the, is where you go to see the Taj Mahal. And so we had an opportunity to see the Taj and learn about its history and learn the story of it. Uh, we had lots of opportunities to spend money. That's my wife with a beautiful ring that we purchased from a jeweler uh, there in Agra uh, that was um, someone that was known to the Air Journeys people to be credible and quality. And uh, we, we had a good experience there. And, uh, and then we, we ventured off the beaten path into the local markets in Agra to see what life's really like there and, uh, and, and found you know, all the things that you would expect you know, in, a, in, a, in a small Indian, uh, Indian city. Um, so quite a, quite an experience, uh, flying through there and parking with the big boys and, and, uh, and, and learning about the local kind of culture. Um, one of the things that really struck us, uh, during this flight, if you notice in this photograph, 
um, everyone's wearing a uniform. And so um, we traveled uh, once we got out of Europe in uniform. And so, you know, you can see I have captain's bars on. Um, we all traveled like this. We had credentials that we wore around our neck. Um, we had the wings, our name tags. We looked like professional pilots. And it turned out to be a really important thing. Um, in Europe and in the United States and in Canada, um, you know, you can fly dressed like I'm dressed. You know, I'm wearing a T-shirt and nobody pays any attention to you. But when you get outside of the places where they're so familiar with uh, general aviation, you really get into a situation where you need to look like a professional. And there was one case where we literally came into a main terminal, we flashed our pilot credentials, and we walked right through immigration. They didn't even look at our passports. It was just remarkable how powerful the uniform was. And this picture on the right here, that's my wife and I, and this was our this was our boarding gate. They put up a sign, November 930, Victor Tango, estimated time of departure, et cetera. It was, uh, it was sort of comical, but powerful. Um, and so again, um, Keith, I'll pause for a second and see if there are any questions. Sure, Jim, we've got one. Uh, did you have any difficulties with any country's authority? Um, the only difficulty we had, um, we had uh, going into Vietnam, well, I guess there were, there's one difficulty and one uh, just a little, um, a little frightening experience, I guess. But going, in, going into Vietnam, um, we had registered for our visas online and they had a new online system. And so uh, we came in, I believe it was a Sunday, and we came in and we went to the, uh, the immigration officials and um, they asked us for our visas and we had the numbers because they had been issued for us. And this is something Air Journey did. We had all the numbers. And so we said, um, we, we registered online, here's the visa number. And the response is not in the system. What do you mean it's not in the system? We don't have it in the system, but here's the receipt. I paid for it, not in the system. So we quickly realized that we were being shaken down and we had carried, you know, you carry a bunch of cash with you for situations like this. Um, so we, we, we ended up um, basically bribing the immigration official, which is what he wanted, uh, to get into Vietnam um, and, and paid, paid the guys off and we paid for everybody. I think it was like three grand in crisp hundred dollar bills uh, and we got through. So that was, that was a one sort of disappointing uh, you know, negative thing. And then the other one is, is actually a good setup for this slide. Um, I'll just play the video that's here first and I'll tell you the story. Uh, Russian fire three watch now. Radar contact line flag will one to zero. Now option, now option for five. Expect a mission for the three to five back. Baller, flight level three one zero over Pakistani airspace. And uh, at this point, uh, India is not accepting us into Indian airspace. Russian fire three watch now. We're 16 minutes away from the Indian border. And uh, G in the plane ahead of us is uh, on the sat phone trying to sort things out with uh, with people on the ground. So uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, we'll see what happens. So so here's the deal. So we've, we've departed Oman. We're heading toward Agra, India. We're over Pakistani airspace. We're we're sort of beyond the point of of returning to our our departure. Uh, from a fuel perspective. And we've been denied entry into Indian airspace. Um, and they literally, the controller said, do not enter Indian airspace, remain clear in Indian airspace. There's five airplanes lined up, G's in front. And so, um, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about, well, what are my options, right? I could land in Pakistan without a permit, go to Karachi, uh, which we were near. Um, I could turn around, oh no, I can't, I don't have enough fuel. We could hopefully sort this out on the sat phone and figure out what the problem is. Uh, or we could violate Indian airspace and go land as planned, um, which actually was um, you know, the, the choice that I would have made um, had uh, it not gotten worked out. It did get worked out on the sat phone. It turned out there was a mistake that the Indian authorities had made in the permitting, we were an hour earlier than they expected us. So our, our permits were not in the system. 
Um, it got sorted out by the ground handlers and we got in and we had no problem. But it was a it was a bit of a hair raising moment trying to figure out like, OK, what the heck are we going to do now? You know, here we are in Indian airspace and you can see the two in the back of the airplane. Our kids joined us in Dubai. Um, and so they they did the Dubai and Southeast Asia or Dubai to Thailand legs of the trip with us and then they flew back home. So we were able to a lot of people did that. They brought people in and people left during the course of the trip. Um, my wife, Deb, was on her own mission during this. And so she, my, my wife is very into fiber arts and craft work. And so she, in every country we went to, um, she purchased fiber of some form, um, hopefully in the form of yarn, but it didn't always work out that way. And then when we got home, you can see the picture on the right. Those are all the different bits of fiber that she got. When we got home, she weaved that into uh, a beautiful kind of table runner that uh, represents every, every country that we went to on the trip. The picture, the guy on the left, left was in Dubai. Um, you know, Dubai doesn't really make textiles. Um, and so we were unable to find yarn. Um, but um, this guy actually brought us from the camel farm, uh, that is fresh cut camel hair in his right hand that smelled, we had it in the front compartment in the plane for the rest of the trip because it smelled terrible. But uh, he brought us that. It was really kind of him. And so that's that's woven into this thing now as well. Um, so that took us now into Southeast Asia. There's the route through Southeast Asia. That was Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam. We spent quite a bit of time here. This is the only place where we crossed the equator. We went into Bali, which was the furthest south that we got. Um, and just so much to do uh, here. You know, as I mentioned, the kids joined us. Uh, we had this wonderful greeter at the Chiang Mai airport. This guy was just a riot. Uh, we had so much fun. He didn't speak any English at all, but he was just a lot of fun. Um, you know, we stayed at the Four Seasons in Chiang Mai and they had, you know, interesting things to do there. You know, dune buggy rides in the jungle, the elephant park, um, you know, spent some time on the, quite a bit of time actually on the Mekong River in various parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, we were, in, we were, um, um, we had an opportunity to, to participate in a number of events that, you know, demonstrating some traditional dance and other cultural elements of the various countries that we went to. Um, this was just amazing that, you know, it's a Cobra in a whiskey bottle uh, that they were, that they were selling. And apparently people actually do drink that. Um, one of the, one of the people with us, this is, this is Paolo and Anna um, and uh Paolo had his, his birthday while we were there uh, in Siem Reap, uh, Cambodia. And so we had a big party that night and, and just had, had an awesome time. And we saw lots of temples. We saw all the temples you would expect with Angkor Wat. Um, uh, we saw uh, Bora Badur. We saw uh, this top prom in Siem Reap, which is the temple with the trees growing out of it. Um, there were there were lots of these little kids. Uh, I just, I'll just tell this story briefly, but um, this adorable little kid, the thing in her hand is something she's trying to sell. She doesn't know any English other than one dollar. She would say one dollar, one dollar, and she would wave this thing around. And you want to you want to help, right? You want to give the kid a dollar and take the thing. And a lot of people did. And what we learned after that, which was kind of a sad lesson, was that if these kids are out on the street and they're successful um, at raising money, um, parents keep them out of school, right? So they don't go to school, they go out and, you know, they pawn stuff on the street. And so, you know, this little girl who was uh, pretty good at getting the $1 um, probably will be kept out of school because she is good at it. So pretty sad lesson. Uh, lots of great sights, you know, like the the chickens on the back of the motorcycle, you know, heading off to, to the uh, to the market. Um, we got to Singapore, which was really an oasis uh, in the middle of Southeast Asia. Spent a couple of nights there. Um, you know, saw lots of sort of local tradition, making the tofu, and uh, visited Borobudur, uh, the temple, which was uh, really remarkable, um, and just met some really interesting people uh, along the way. So uh, some pretty amazing sites as well. And then this last photo, uh, we, we ended up having lunch with a, with a local family. Uh, this young woman on the right, 
uh, was at the hotel and uh, her family put on a luncheon for several of us, uh, which was great. And they were, uh, they were a lot of fun. Their English was pretty good. And uh, this is in Vietnam. And uh, we, had a, we had a very nice meal with them. Uh, how many of you have ever experienced a volcano briefing in your flying? I certainly hadn't. And so we were in Bali and while we were there, Mount Agung erupted. And when Mount Agung erupted, uh, it left volcanic ash on the airport in Bali. It left a, a deposit of volcanic ash on the airplanes. Uh, and it, of course, there was an ash plume that was moving uh, with the winds. And so we were studying this. It ended up uh, delaying our departure from Bali by one day. Uh, you cannot fly uh, a turbine engine, uh, any engine for that matter, through a volcanic ash. It's quite damaging. Uh, and so we were grounded uh, until the winds changed and we were able to, to get out. But it was interesting uh, getting out. So the photograph on the left is one of many that I took when we were flying over Mount Agung. We got these amazing views sort of right down into, right down into the volcano. Um, very, very cool experience. Um, that took us on to, you know, Asia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan. Um, I'll just show you some of the highlights here. Kyoto was beautiful, the temples there. Uh, Hong Kong, we spent time in. This kid, you can see him wearing a Boston Red Sox hat because we gave him one. Uh, he was just a great handler, really fun and very helpful and generally nice guy. And uh, we, brought a, we brought a case of Red Sox hats with us that we gave away to people who were particularly helpful. Um, we got to visit air traffic control in Hong Kong, you know, shuttled by helicopter, had a lot of fun at the museum, saw the changing of the guard in Taipei, uh, went to the National Palace Museum in Taipei, uh, flew into Osaka, Japan, got to see the sumo wrestlers in Nagoya, uh, the Gion Festival in Kyoto, which was quite a sight. And, uh, and then this is the airport where we landed. This is Osaka airport from, from the air. Um, which was quite a sight. And those of you who may be familiar with this airport know that it's, it's a bit of an engineering disaster. Uh, this airport is continually sinking. Uh, it's, a, it's been very expensive, obviously, to build and now to maintain. Um, had dinner with the geishas and, uh, and, and had a, a great time in, in this part of the world. Um, I will say the TBMs were awesome. Uh, we had five of them on this trip. Uh, we had two 930s, uh, we had a 910, we had a 900, and we had an 850. Uh, there was not a single problem uh, with any of the TBMs, except the 850 had one uh, transient pressurization problem that was a one-time event that uh, turned out to not be an issue. Um, the, the, the planes were bulletproof. And here, this was Paolo and I having some fun with Photoshop, you know, because uh, talking about all the stuff we were packing. But the, the TBMs were really terrific. And then the last part of the trip was, you know, kind of the sprint home, you know, from Japan, we went through Russia, um, you know, into Alaska and Seattle, Washington. And uh, the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia is just stunning. It's volcanic. The views were amazing. Uh, we spent one night there in Petropavlovsk. Um, you know, we, we got to see a little bit of the local um, living in Petropavlovsk. This is uh, our group in the middle there, some of us. Uh, in the local grocery store. I'm sure we were buying some vodka while we were there. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, lots of uh, really cool volcanoes and interesting Russian experiences. So in, in this photo, this is Lizzie again, who I showed earlier. So when we landed in Petropavlovsk, we were surrounded by armed guards immediately. And uh, the armed guards were, um, their English was not that good. Uh, they were not super friendly, um, but Lizzie is this bubbly, friendly person, and she befriended one of them. And she asked if she could take a picture of him. And he said, no, no photos. Couldn't take a photo. So somehow she convinced him to give her his hat. And uh, we got this picture of Lizzie wearing the Russian guard's hat, which I'm sure was uh, uh, not, well, I'm sure it was frowned upon quite a bit by, uh, by his superiors there. Um, but this was us finishing dinner and uh, here a little bit in, uh, in Anchorage. We visited the Boeing Museum when we got down to uh, Seattle and, uh, and that was kind of it. 
And so this is, uh, this is the TBM, our TBM landing back at home. And I would just summarize this with, um, you know, we really forged a number of what are now lifelong friendships with the people that we traveled with. It was just an amazing experience. We're still in touch with everybody we traveled with. Um, we're having, you know, there's weekly exchanges through WhatsApp and whatnot. And, uh, you know, these are people living in Europe and here in the US. Uh, and the experience was, uh, was a great bonding experience. And then I'll, I will leave you um, with this thought. Um, just play a little video here. Just listen uh, carefully. No, number 930, Victor Tango, ready for takeoff, runway 23. 930, All right, so no more whining about air traffic control in the U.S. because this is what you're dealing with outside of this country. I mean, there was a lot of just incomprehensible radio communications. And then, um, you know, the Dyer was great. Dyer tracked us all the way around the world. Um, they were helpful if we needed anything. We actually did call them about the volcano uh, and flying through that plume. And they talked to Pratt and Whitney and they confirmed that that would be a bad idea, which we knew, but we were hoping we might get out sooner. Air Journey did a great, op a great job, Columbia Air Services, uh, in Grant, Connecticut was the dealer um, that I bought the TBM from and they were very, very helpful. Uh, the guys up here in Vermont at Stowe Aviation were super helpful. And of course, my wife, Deb, who put up with all this and, um, and we had really the trip uh, of a lifetime. We did do a blog. There's a, uh, there's a website out there called bombsaway.net if anybody's interested in seeing more, some of this stuff is up there. And then the last thing I'll show you is uh, just this video. We did uh, every place we went for every day we took a little bit of video and this is a one second a day video. And so if you just watch this, this is one second from each day of our trip. So this was my, uh, this was my son's idea and uh, my wife and I both did it. This is mine and uh, she has her own as well. So Keith, while this is uh, while this is wrapping up, any other questions you've got there? Sure, we've got a couple. Um, one of our members has asked, did you use the inReach for communications or just tracking? Yep, um, I did use it for communications. I used it uh, quite a lot actually for text messaging, um, mo mostly for fun and not really didn't really need it. But uh, but yeah, it, it worked great. I'm a, I'm a huge uh, fan of the inReach. It worked very well for for tracking as well as uh, as well as uh, text communications with friends and family. What about uh, the aircraft in your group? Were they a combination of single pilot and dual pilot, or you know what were the cases? Yeah, there were um, three of us were single pilot and two of us were dual pilot. So the two that were dual pilot, um, one of them was the um, uh, the, the group that flew, um, with, um, uh, with G, um, the, the 910. And the other one was the fellow from outside of London, uh, who flew with Danielle and the rest of us flew at single pilot. And what about, um, aircraft throughout the trip? Did they all start in the same place and end in the same place or did, did they pick up and drop off as, as time went? Yeah, great question. So we, we actually did not all start and end in the same place. Um, we ended up meeting um, two of the people, one, one, of, one of the airplanes, the 850, joined us in Shannon. Um, one of the 930s, actually two of them joined us in, uh, we had two groups join us in Athens. And then, and then we were together the rest of the way around um, and everyone did come into the US through Anchorage and uh, some of them spent a little bit of time here before they went home. Any others? Jim, we've got a lot of people saying thank you. This was a thank you for sharing this adventure of a lifetime. Um, 
no other questions that have popped up. We put in a last call. But other than that, uh, I wanted to thank you very much. That was very, very enjoyable and enlightening. And I'll uh, toss, it, toss it back over to David. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Keith. Keith. And I would echo that and that it was uh, really, it was really neat. To, I've seen some of your pictures before, um, Jim, because I followed some of some of the pictures that you posted as you were doing your trip, but I hadn't heard a lot about a lot of the stories behind this. I was really, that was really great to hear about, hear about that. And, uh, and I think that, you know, what you said echoes what a lot of other people have told me as well about you know, how fortunate we are to have the freedoms we have with general aviation flying in the United States. It's so easy to take that for granted. So, um, so I think that's definitely something we can all appreciate. Um, just one question I have for you is I'm curious and the whole trip around the world, what was your total log flight hours for the whole, for that whole trip? 88.3. 88.3. So that's, yeah, that's good. And what, 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 what was it, what was the duration of the time, the whole time, uh, when you started and when you, when you, um, finished? You know, elapsed time. Well, I mean the um, date. Like, what what period of time was that date was? It was about uh, seventy days, so sixty nine days is what yeah. we. And we left. We left kind of in the in the early spring. Yep. Got it. Okay. Cool. So yeah, and I don't mm -hmm. think many of us have logged eighty eight hours in uh, in seventy days. That's that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of flying, but but honestly, when I added it up at the end, it was it was uh, less than I thought. Right when I right. When I, in that TBM, it had a thousand hours on it, and people are like, "Oh, this airplane flew around the world." It's like, yeah, it was only eighty-eight of a thousand hours. Yeah, it, right. It's really if you look at it that way, that's you're, it's not not that much. So yeah, and it also amazed me as well to hear that the legs were were actually as short as they were. Um, it's not like you were you were flying all day in most cases. So um, yeah, so that's uh, well. Thanks again. That was that was that was wonderful presentation. We really appreciate you sharing it with us, and we'll make it available as a recording for our members as well for those that weren't able to, to see it tonight. Um, and just want to also thank everyone for, for joining tonight. I hope everyone has a, has a wonderful summer and I look forward, forward to seeing some of you at our, at our future um, uh, outing and fly out events. So have a good evening and happy flying. Thanks again for having me and uh, thanks everybody for, for listening. So take care. <laughs>